David Tenenbaum tonight will detail his experience as a whistleblower persecuted for years by anti-Semitic threats in his new memoir. Currently a civilian mechanical engineer for the Army, where he has been employed since 1985, Dr. Tenenbaum had first disclosed vulnerabilities with the Army's death trap Humvees in 1995. He developed the armor program to better protect those vehicles against improvised explosive device, devices. Following his, threat, his disclosure, he was falsely accused of being an Israeli spy and having due loyalty because of his Jewish faith. The FBI conducted a full-scale multi-year criminal investigation of him and his family, and Army officials halted all of Dr. Tenenbaum's research programs. The official report to the FBI director eventually found that there was no evidence that he had done anything ever wrong, and the Department of Defense's Inspector General issued an investigative report confirming that the U.S. Army was guilty of anti-Semitism. Despite this, uh, he, he has his his court case has gone nowhere uh, uh, to, to get reimbursement and compensation for the way he was treated. Dr. David Tenenbaum uh, has has spent 36 years of service for the U.S. Army. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in chemical engineering and a doctorate in business administration. He has extensive experience conducting risk assessment and assessing technologies worldwide. Uh, to quote attorney John Witte, Dr. Tenenbaum's harrowing tale of a corrupt government bureaucracy bent on his destruction reads like fiction. It's not. Tenenbaum's courage and his resolve to contribute to the safety of U.S. soldiers is what makes his memoir remarkable. I'm proud to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. David Tenenbaum. Welcome, doctor. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good. I'm going to share the screen right now, um, and hopefully you guys can see this. I'd like to go back a little bit on this. Um, okay, all right. So the first thing I have to tell everybody <clears throat> is that I'm not representing a government. I'm not representing myself as a government employee. I'm giving this talk on my own time. There is nothing classified. Everything you can find on here is an open literature. My book actually went through the Pentagon pre-publication review and it was cleared for, for uh, talking about or, or being written. And I could show you documents as long as I don't show you the sealed documents. So I wanna start off like this. My story is a true story. And even though people sometimes will look at me and they'll say, come on, you're, you're making this stuff up. And it's not, this, it's not fiction. It sounds like fiction, but it's not. It's a story about anti-Semitism. It's a story about a lack of accountability from our own US government. It's a story about the deaths of our own US soldiers because of cut off your nose to spite your face, the prejudice and anti-Semitism of high level government Are they trying people. to get a good feel? Like and as my attorney said, the government has blood on their hands. And we're talking about the blood of US soldiers. Anti-Semitism is alive and well in our own government. My own background is very simple. I was hired in December 1984 to work in the, for the U.S. Army, and they said, "Hey, you know, you've been to Israel. You know, you know how the Israeli culture is. You know the land. You speak Hebrew fluently. We can use you in our Israeli programs, and you'd be great for that." And I was also suspected because I speak Hebrew, I've been to Israel, and I know the land. So I was suspected for the very same reasons that I was hired in the first place. I was suspected of being a spy. I was suspected of treason. So my, I usually I, I, what I do is when I speak in, uh, in person, I always ask the question to people, what's the penalty for espionage? And most people get it pretty much right this the first time. The penalty for espionage is the death penalty or life in prison. Uh, and I was facing that for a few years. I want to show you, uh, pro this is the program I was working on. This here's, it's a Humvee. Hopefully if it works, you're gonna hear, listen up. 
I don't see where to. I don't know if you could see it or not. But what happened in this, in this anyways, was a, um, an IED, an improvised explosive device. I was working on a program with the Israelis and the Germans to make sure the Humvees did not get destroyed. My job is part of my background. I was hired to make sure soldiers come home alive in one piece. And the client, it was the, is a soldier, a US soldier, and that's it. <clears throat> it's going to be one of the only things that a government employees should be looking towards is to make sure that we protect our very own and US soldiers. The conception of the program started probably around 1994. And as we know, IEDs do a tremendous job. They go right through the Humvees because you know what? The Humvees were never made to uh, protect against IEDs. Now you have to go back. In 1995, there was a memo from the Pentagon and they said it was from a low level employee, but it's, it had to come from a higher level employee, otherwise they don't get out. And it said that pretty much anybody in the Department of Defense, Department of the Army that works, that is Jewish, is a potential spy for Israel. Keeping that in mind, again, my program started around that time period, fatalities, uh, Humvee in the thousands from the IEDs, literally in the thousands, not just deaths, but maiming, losing arms, losing limbs, and you lose a whole lot more, which you won't even get into. We devised the program to look at um, the Humvee and make it more survivable. But I was, um, I was at that point being looked at as a potential spy. Now, I didn't even know. Apparently, what was going on, it started like I found out later. Now, I started working for the government in 1984. I was suspected apparently from the 1988 of being a spy, of giving information to the Israelis. Where it comes from is that is this. Here's what's called a Sayida, a submersive and it's espionage directed against the army. You work for the government, you see somebody doing something that they shouldn't be doing, that's a possible threat, you must report it right away. Now that leaves a lot of openings. If someone says, hey, you know, I don't like this guy, so I'm gonna report him. The FBI comes in, does a preliminary investigation, could be three to six months, and they might clear him, they might not. I had people filing Saida after Saida against me. There were seven, apparently. Saidas can range for different reasons, but you must file it as soon as you see somebody doing something wrong. There were people that filed Saidas against me nine years afterwards. Now, they have actually violated a, a, a rule, a government rule, they can actually be subjected to criminal sanctions. Uh, the person that filed it set nine years after was asked, why did you, why did you wait nine years? He said, I didn't want to appear anti-Semitic. I think by filing it nine years later, you are anti-Semitic, but that's a different one. So another, another one, a guy filed uh, something against me and he said, you know, he speaks Hebrew. We have four liaison officers on our base. And um, um, did, did we just lose? I'm sorry. Did we? Yep. David, just please share your screen again. Somebody okay. share theirs by mistake. Okay. Got it. Okay. So um, I don't remember where I was, but anyways, someone said there's four liaison officers in the base UK, German, um, Canada, and Israel. I work with any one of them, depending on the time, but what I was, what I was doing. One person said, hey, you know, Tenenbaum, he's, he speaks Hebrew, liaison officer, he's really liaison officer, he speaks Hebrew, a Jew speaking to another Jew, that makes us worried. And they filed the Saida against me based on that. Now, every time it's filed, the FBI comes in and decides, hey, there's, there's a problem here. And they did their, they did their shtick, they said, the guy didn't do anything wrong but it kept on happening over and over again and um, weren't able to, uh, not sure what's going on, but weren't able to, to uh, show that I did anything wrong. There was no evidence. I had done nothing wrong. So as we go along in this, which I'm not sure why things aren't moving here um, to the next slide. 
but this is this is what the damage an IED does, and okay. So what happens is very simple. People would complain. One guy actually was in a he was going through his own. Uh, he was being looked at from the FBI, whatever, and he said, "Oh, Tenenbaum. I had a dream about Tenenbaum." And I remember Tenenbaum, he worked with Israelis. He could be a spy. So they actually did an investigation based on this guy's dream that I could possibly be a spy. It was getting so ridiculous. The FBI kept, kept telling people, you know, guys, I think there's enough here. We have no information. Stop coming to me until you can verify things. What happened was, I went to Israel, I've been to Israel three times for the government, 1985, 86, and 95. I came back in 95, you're supposed to brief your uh, people that are coming back from overseas to just give them a debriefing. I went through the debriefing nine months to a year afterwards and the Department of Investigative Services suspected I was doing something wrong because I couldn't remember the name of the hotel I stayed in a year before. My kids, I always complain, I don't even remember their name sometimes, so I couldn't remember the name of a hotel. That didn't go over very well with them. Here's a timeline, just to give you an idea of what's happening. I went to Israel three times for the government. February 1997, I was accused of treason. And in that accusation, what happened was very simple. The head of counterintelligence intelligence, Lieutenant Colonel John Semenini at the time, decided that he was gonna find some, this guy, this Tenenbaum guy, who was a Jew, and apparently, based on the information we got from people that worked for him, he did not like Jews. He did not like Israel, he did not like Jews. And if there were a, there's a Chinese guy on the base, or a Russian guy on the base, didn't matter. But if an Israeli guy was on the base, he went ballistic. And this is coming not from me, but from the guy that worked for him and said, John was a known anti-Semite. Great to know. But it wasn't good for me because he wanted to find a spy. And I was the guy he was looking for because I worked with Israel. What happened was I was told to put in for a higher level clearance. Why would they do that? Because if I put in for a higher level clearance, they can interview me without having an attorney present. And they can ask me any questions they want and get me to give information that I was possibly spying. But the problem was I wasn't, I wasn't acquiescing because I didn't want the high level clearance. And I told them I didn't want the clearance. And it took me a year to get the paperwork in. And uh, they were actually asked afterwards, why would you put a guy in for a higher level clearance if you suspected him of being a spy? And they said, well, we just wanted to clear himself. That's a great way of doing it. But you didn't tell him he's under investigation and you can't investigate him anyways because only the FBI can do that. Yeah, but we felt it was the best way of doing it for him. This is what happened. I was interviewed by two people, we'll call them right now. Uh, we used to call them the Keystone Cops. They were from the 902nd Military Intelligence Division from Selfridge Air Force Base. They came in under the auspices of a security clearance investigation, and, um, but they were really investigating me for being a spy. And they would ask me questions and they left for lunch they went to John Simonini and John Simonini said, tell him he's violated numerous, numerous federal regulations and get him to agree to a polygraph. I went into, after lunch, it was good cop, bad cop, bad cop said, hey, you, um, you violated a lot of, lot of federal regulations and um, you need to take a polygraph. And I said, well, what if I don't? Well, best case scenario is, you're gonna be stuck in a, in a corner the rest of your career. We're not gonna give any work to do. Possibly you'll get arrested and you're fired or you know, worse. I said, well, what's worse? What could be worse than that? So what happened was I said I had no choice. I didn't know my rights at that point and I agreed to the polygraph and I took that two weeks later. And I asked, asked at the polygraph, I'd like to record this. And they said, we don't, you're not allowed to record the polygraph. And I, as I went into the polygraph, I realized why I wasn't allowed to record the polygraph. What happened at the polygraph, if you understand how polygraphs work, you have to be very, very calm. And 
the, you know, they ask you, have you taken any drugs the night before, any Advil, are you drinking, get a good night's rest? Everything was going fine until the polygrapher started screaming at me. And I've done other Jews before and gotten them to confess. And I'll get you to confess too. And a matter of fact, he said to me, yeah, I had a, this Jewish guy that was married to an Israeli. He wouldn't confess, but I finally got him to. And he said, I could tell you're lying by, by the look in your eyes. And that, that, that doesn't exactly calm you down. And it didn't help me too much. And towards the end of the polygraph, he said, you have until um, Monday to confess. I said, to confess to what? He said, I want you to sign a confession. I said, when you sign a confession to what? He says that you're a spy. But I'm not a spy. Yes, you are. I'm not a spy. And he said, you have till Monday. And I left, I left the office. This is after seven, eight hours of being grilled. He went and told the FBI confessed. He said Tenenbaum confessed to giving information on every program he's ever worked on over a 10-year period uh, to every Israeli he's ever met inadvertently. Uh, how that's possible, I really don't know. But that, all of a sudden, that was like literally lighting the fuse. And the FBI was thrilled. They, are now, they now have a spy. They're going to do an investigation. I didn't know any of this. Uh, besides the fact that he conveniently, the polygrapher, Albert Snyder, conveniently destroyed his notes after the uh, polygraph. I went home. I still didn't really think about, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on. And Friday morning, I decided I have to go into work early. I couldn't sleep that night. I just wanted to get out of my system and go to my office. And my computer's missing, which it doesn't take a, you know, uh, nuclear scientists to figure out your computer's missing, somebody's, somebody's playing with you. They, they had told the guards at the gate, let them in, we're, we're going to have the FBI come in and start to grill them. And uh, I went out of my office for, so I, had a, I had to file a report with the military police, came back to my office, I was surrounded by FBI, CIA, DIS, name an acronym, I was surrounded by the acronym. And this was all in the open in front of my colleagues. And I was brought into a room and the lead agent from the FBI, James Cugino, Special Agent Cugino, looked at me and said, okay, Mr. Tenenbaum, why don't you tell us what's going on? And I looked at him and said, why don't you tell me what's going on? And he said, well, there's spying going on here and it's with Israel. And I said, so the spying is with Israel and I'm the Jew, so I'm the spy? He said, well, let's talk about you know, what, you know, all this information, which he got from the polygrapher, the problem was the polygrapher gave him false information and I was correcting him and he actually was believing me and not the polygrapher. As in, in a deposition, he actually said that he felt the, de the, the polygrapher was lying, which is a good, good thing from my side. And the FBI special agent looked at me and said, we want to search your house. And I said, good luck. <laughs> yeah, I'm not giving you permission to search my house. And I said, I'm leaving. And he said to me, you don't want to get permission? I said, I'm leaving. If you want to arrest me, arrest me. Otherwise, I'm leaving. I said, he said, I have nothing to arrest you on. I said, fine, I'm out of here. And I started to walk out. And I figured they're going to arrest me anyways. Everybody in my office in arounds was looking at what was going on. They heard what happened. Um, doesn't do too much for your career. And I was on a uh, fast track to, for his congressional appointee when this all happened. I was chosen to be um, a exchange engineer to Israel. It was going pretty well until this all happened. I ended up, I get into the parking lot. I could still feel everybody's eyes on me. I, op I put my hand on the door handle of my car and there's a, there's a tap on my shoulder. And there's an MP in back of me. He says, Mr. Tenemam, I need your badge. I gave him my badge, he used it to scrape off the decal on my, on my window. Got in my car started to go home and I kept looking in my rear view mirror thinking any moment now, I'm gonna see the red and blue lights and I'm gonna get pulled over and I'm gonna get arrested. Didn't happen, got home. My wife looks at me and says, what are you doing home so early? It's a Friday. I said, well, I'm having a few problems at work. And she said, what kind of problems? I said, well, they think I'm a spy. She said, for who? I said, Israel. She said, are you? I said, she thought, she didn't mean I was a spy. She thought I maybe made some mistake. I said, no. But um, I had to get an attorney. 
at that time and I got an attorney and uh, the next day I want you I want you to put something in perspective for a moment imagine you're in your house on Shabbos on the Sabbath you're in your house calm it's 12 noon no you have guests over Shabbos is a restful time three cars pull up to your driveway Shabbos afternoon seven eight agents get out with guns come to your door and they say we have a search warrant it was illegal because it was based on total false information come into your house take your house apart got two little kids a year and a half four and a half i think my daughter is four and a half who years late for years she wouldn't answer the door she'd scream if you if you go to the door to answer the door and she'd say don't answer the door you don't know who it is years it took they took my house apart and they left and i was followed 24 hours a day for months and all based on false information all based on some guy who didn't like jews it was a ruse the whole personal security investigation was a ruse they can't do the investigation themselves in the army so what they do is they get the FBI to do it, but they were doing their own investigation. But what happened was, instead, when, when the search warrants went through the system, they have reporters waiting to see anything interesting. And apparently, the FBI forgot to seal my files, conveniently forgot to seal my files. You ever know what it's like being accused of being a spy and having people who want to basically take a pot shot at you? That's what happened with me. And uh, I wasn't home when it became public on that Monday or Tuesday the following week. But the newspapers printed out, search yields classified items. There were no classified items, otherwise you and I wouldn't be here speaking. But let's see what they took out of my house. They said at the time, uh, the FBI, um, they were pulling things out of my house. I said, what are you taking my music books out? I play violin, I play guitar. They said, well, you never know, there could be something covert about the notes. I said, are you kidding me? And they took out this, fiddle book I had. They said that was possible spy material. Another Shlomo Karbach song book. And they took out, see these, see these marks over here? I don't know if you guys can see it. My daughter, I was four and a half and she drew these. My, my one and a half year old drew these too. They felt this could be possible spy material as well. And I found out later after I was, I was actually eventually cleared I'm not, again, I'm trying to move along with this as, you know, as quickly as possible. But I was eventually cleared around, uh, see, February 1997 is when uh, the, the charges or, or, or I, was, I was accused. And around February 1998, a letter from the US prosecutor's office came down and said, this is one of the most thorough investigations we've ever been on. And, and there's no evidence that Tenenbaum did, ever did anything wrong. And uh, at the time this happened, my work was trying to figure out what do we do with this guy? And do we bring him back or not? And the head attorney at TACOM said, I work for TACOM, I work for Tardic. TACOM, a base in Michigan said, you know what? We got to figure out what to do with him. If he comes back, he doesn't get a security clearance back. You don't have to keep, we can fire him. And you know, maybe we should monitor him also. You know, I'm thinking they're going to tether me as, after I've been cleared. I was finally brought back to work in May 1998. And I had to go see the head, the director of Tardic at the time. And the director of Tardic brought me in his office and said, you know, Mr. Tannenbaum, just so you know, all the charges have been dropped. You're a new engineer. And I said, hold on a second. So there were never any charges. There were basis accusations, anti-Semitic accusations. I'm not a new engineer. I'm uh, an engineer with maybe 20 years experience. He said, well, I'm so, he started to stammer. And they actually, um, the guy who did this to me retired as a lieutenant colonel because he couldn't make colonel, but they brought him back eventually at a higher level position as a civilian instead of firing him. The Tardic director looked at me and said, look, you can't go back to your old programs. We shuttered them. You can't work with Israel anymore. You can't go back to your old office. You're done. And oh, by the way, we're revoking your security clearance. And I said, oh, imagine what would happen if I'd have been guilty. And uh, they give you reasons why they revoke your, they're going to revoke your clearance, a whole bunch of reasons. 
one of the, one of the reasons was I carry a backpack, and somebody suspected it's full of class on material. That was one of the reasons. Another one was I was holding a party with Israeli liaison officer at my house one night, and uh, by the way, that party was I was sitting shiva for my father. He was coming to be uh, Menachem Abel to give his condolences. And uh, I had to answer all those ridiculous accusations. But those ridiculous accusations that I answered went back through um, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson and any at the time. So he had final say on it. So guess what he's gonna say? So eventually I had to go in front of a judge. And the judge was just um, very interesting. He said, I called him on the phone. He said, this should take about an hour. I said, it's gonna take a lot longer than that. I don't remember if it's the first or the second time, but at one point, uh, my youngest son was born and the bris was gonna be held, the circumcision ceremony was supposed to be held that Friday, when I was supposed to go in front of him. And I called him and I told him, and he said, well, the date of this hearing was set before your son was born, we're not moving it. And uh, I was the first one out of the ceremony and I had a friend of mine take me downtown we went through about 16 hours altogether in front of the judge. And thank God I had great attorneys who uh, Dan Harold and Mike Morgenroth who have been nothing but just, just su superb, been like family to us also, been with us every step of the way. And um, we also have another attorneys now too from the Government Accountability Project. John Whitty is, is, is a part of that too. It's wanted to mention that. But we did sue the government and um, I did get my security clearance back eventually when I was told I'd never get it back again. And I not only got it back, but I was actually given a higher level clearance, which showed how wrong they were. And we sued the government and uh, we were actually winning. We went through two, over two years of discovery until one fine day, Lieutenant Colonel Johnson and any in a deposition said, um, Jews are different. That's just the way they are. They can't separate their culture from their religion. That's just what they're gonna do. They pulled him out and pretty soon after they invoked the state secrets privilege and we were stuck. We couldn't do anything about it. And eventually what we did is we went to Senator Levin who ordered the inspector general's office to do a separate investigation. And uh, the inspector general's office and my, my, my words I'm gonna use were neo-Nazis in the inspector general's office who were trying to scuttle the report which is coming out in our favor. And we found out about it and we had a guy in the, in the inspector general's office, Dan Meyer, who was in, amazing. I mean, I, I, we, I, we owe him so much. He put, it, he put his job on the line for me and he eventually was, um, was, was fired from the inspector general's office. Hey, Dan. And um, it, it was like, it was, it was incredible what they were trying to do. But eventually the report came out and said that, that it was anti-Semitism. Um, there were people in the inspector general's office who didn't like that, who actually said at the time, uh, it was a guy who was a high level guy, Henry Shelley, who said that, I have this in a, in a email from somebody, that the only reason Carl Levin took the uh, case in the first place is Carl Levin's Jewish, his right hand man's Jewish, Tenenbaum's Jewish, it's a Jewish conspiracy. And uh, the funny part thing is that when this report came out, uh, it's the newspapers in my base sold out like, like, like within, within minutes. And that day it was front page news. And I had people coming up to me and said, they pointed to that. I thought they're going to say, wow, you made it. They pointed to the paper and they said, this is your fault. You did this. And I said, excuse me. I said, you did this. Not soon thereafter, I was told, uh, I was ordered to undergo a drug test that said it's a random drug test. They said, you know, just based on my security clearance, I thought that was pretty funny. Never did it because I was able to point to what regulation were they pointing to. Um, these are, I was told the problem was, and I was told at one point when this was all going on that I was going to jail. There was a good chance I was going to jail. And one a high level DOD official was asked, what would my motive be for being a spy? It's, it was couched in Babylonian history that Jews are stateless, they have none or multiple loyalties. And another official was asked why Tenenbaum did it. Why did he spy? And the one he said, because he's Jewish. That's why. I'm on David Duke website. I'm on different Ku Klux Klan websites. And the, the people that testified, the agents, said the fact that Tenenbaum was Orthodox 
that was the number one indicator. He was a spy. But my one of the directors, the associate director at Takeom said, if he wouldn't have been Jewish, it never would have happened. This I just want you to see this slide. This is a this is a slide when I was actually giving a briefing on something that I found out later somebody complained. They said, look at what Tenenbaum did. He made the Israeli flag bigger than the American flag. I don't see that. But that shows he's he's for Israel. Um, until we complained, I was on one of the websites from Aberdeen Proving Ground. I was on a website as being one of the major spies. I was put up there with um, Robert Kim. I don't know if you know these people, but I was put up there with high level spies and I never did anything. We complained. They said, you can't do that. And they changed it eventually. But the report came out and said, I didn't do anything wrong. A high level Pentagon official did say it was when they invoked the state secrets privilege, it wasn't state secrets. It was state embarrassment. When this was all going on and we were going through the inspector general's office before the report was given, many organizations sent letters on my behalf. One of the assistant um, um, I, inspector generals, I don't know, I forgot what they're called, the associate directors took the letters and shredded them before the inspector general could see them. And she said, I don't have to deal with those people. When the inspector general found out, he wasn't very happy about it as well, by the way. So I'm again, skipping, I'm trying to make this as quick as possible. Um, what happened to the people? This is like a TV show. Where are they now? Well, the main people got promoted that did this, that were the anti-Semites. They got promoted, you know, they and others, uh, retired in good standing. Others got like $30,000 awards, which is pretty good for, um, uh, for doing like horrendous things. Now, keep something in mind. This is a hate crime. It's a, if this would have happened in private industry, never would have gone anywhere. It would have been stopped right away. The people would have been fired and everything would have been cleaned up. Let me tell you where, what's happened even, even since then. Thank God I was able, I've, I have to find my own programs. I put out, I put out I, my own research and I can do things, but they usually they take it and they give someone else a credit for it after I do it. Just a couple weeks ago, I was on the phone with somebody. People don't understand. They said, yeah, but so now you can get promoted. I haven't been promoted in 20 years. Um, my ratings over the last three years, I've been rated, you can't get any lower the ratings I've gotten. I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm just telling you this, this, this is fact. I've been rated at the moron level. I, I had a deal with somebody, a contractor, recently, about a month ago, and I was speaking to him, and we were just talking about kind of the work that he, he was hoping that we can help him with, and he somehow Googled my name while I'm on the phone with him, and all of a sudden, he says to me, I'm not working with you. I, I said, what do you mean? He said, I don't trust you. I said, okay, so you Google me, and I said, you know, I have been cleared of everything. He said, I don't care, I don't know, I don't know who to believe. It's not my job to figure out who's right and wrong. I said, well, I'm telling you what's, who's right and wrong. He said, I'm not working with you. I don't have to work with you. And we're done. That was it. End of phone call. So this is a continuation. The problem is we're, I think, by being complacent about this, we, we're letting these type of things happen. I've gone to people for help. And I've gone to organizations for help. And many times, and most of the time, they'd say, it's not the right time. And I've heard this for 20 years. Like, when will be the right time? You know, what's, what's going to happen? What's going to make it the right time? We can, we can be like the monkeys and we can pretend it doesn't happen. My father was a Holocaust survivor. He was in Auschwitz. He was in different camps. And he passed away about a year before this happened to me. And he used to say to me, don't think it can happen again. And quite honestly, thank God he wasn't here to see it because he wouldn't, he wouldn't, wouldn't be able to deal with it. He was just very sensitive to things. David, and, over the last 20 years after, after um, uh, the reports came out exonerating you, how have your supervisors and coworkers been treating you for the last 20 years? Oh, horrendously. I mean, I had a file at different points in time with the EEO. I filed at one point, um, we, had a, we actually had to go to, I went to a couple senators. I went to Senator Peters from Michigan and McCaskill as well. 
they wrote a letter to the Secretary of Defense for me, and they said, this is ridiculous. You got to do something. This guy didn't do anything wrong, and he was helping, and you have never done anything. You never let a, give a letter of apology, zero. And they came back and said, there was no anti-Semitism. Well, let, let's get some, let's go for some quotes. We used to call him our little Jewish spy. Anything you get to Tannenbaum goes right to the Israelis. He did it because he's Jewish. John was a known anti-Semite. Shelley says it's a Jewish conspiracy. And the army said, there's no anti-Semitism. I don't know about you, that sounds kind of anti-Semitic to me. So in that span of time, Shell, I've been treated like um, they've tried to get me to quit, is one way of putting it. They've marginalized me, trying not to give me any work, and I try to do as much as I can. And I have, thank God, I've been able to put things overseas that our soldiers do use and, and working on that. But, um, and I'm not, I can't quit because I can't get another job, and nor do I want to. I still feel my job is to protect the soldier. That's it. And if I can continue doing that, then I will do that, whether they keep on trying to stop me or not, but I can help. And um, it's important, I think, for all of us to realize, you know, people should read my book and get angry. That something like this should occur in today's day and age in the United States. More importantly, hopefully they should take away from the book the message is never give up, fight against injust injustice, and transform the negative life experiences and the positive ones by how you react. Don't be defined by what happens to you, but be, be rather the way you react to it. Let's react positively. And my way of reacting is, I'm gonna keep on trying to work as best as I can and help. What were some of the psychological effects? This is a question that's come up. What are some of the psychological effects of this persecution on you and your family? How, how did you, you and your family cope? God, I'm, I'm, I'm glad my wife's not here now. She's a social worker. <laughs> that, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be, be difficult. So I'll answer like this. Um, I won't lie to you. It's had an effect. It's, it's a PTSD. Um, my, my kids have said it's, a, it's affected them because I wasn't around for them because I was trying to stay out of jail. And when you try to stay out of jail, your kind of focus is let's stay out of jail. Psychologically, it's also, um, it's like, I can forgive everything almost that happened, but I can never forgive the time I was pulled and taken away from my family and my kids. I couldn't give everything I, I wanted to give. How, how can somebody? And um, in that respect, it's had an effect. But, you know, I, I am an Orthodox Jew, and we have, and Muna, we have faith. And I believe that things happen for a reason and it's, everything's for the good. We just have to see it and, and recognize it and do whatever we can. In my community, I mean, the FBI comes in, their expectation is to separate you from the community. And the community I live in is amazing. They never ever left me by alone. They were always there for me. And I can't say enough good things about it. And, and my attorneys, I can't say enough good about them too. Um, and I'll tell you actually a little quick story. I was in Cleveland one time when this couple years after this happened, we were driving to New York and I stopped off in a pizza place with my, my family, a kosher pizza place. And the guy saw my credit card and he said, Tenenbaum, are you the guy this all happened to? And I said, yeah. He said, I want you to know when this happens that everybody in the community was saying to him for you. They were all saying it's a Psalms. We were all praying for you that everything should go okay to recognize that Jews all over the world were concerned and were trying to be there for me, it helps, it helps a lot. What, what uh, this question has come up, uh, in fact, one person who works for the VA who's Jewish said that uh, he's also run into anti-Semitic situations. So one question is, what advice do you have for other Jews who are working for the government or for governmental agencies to protect themselves from false accusations? Well, first of all, I have to uh, um, say that, number one, I did get calls from other Jews when this was going on, you should know. And they were going through their security clearance being revoked, they had relatives in Israel, and they asked me, they said, you know, what do we do? And I said, you have to stick up for yourself, you have to fight. And they said, they're gonna get mad at me. I said, they're already going to take, they're trying to fire you. How much are they going to get mad at me? I went to people to get help. 
what is going on? And I said, you have connections, can you help? He said, you know, better don't do anything. You know, they're gonna get mad at you. I said, get mad at me. They're trying to put, give me the death sentence and put, or put me away for life. How much mad are they gonna get? You have to fight, do it the right way. Get an attorney if you have to, but you have to fight. I see that uh, Dan Meyer is on uh, um, this webinar with us. And Dan Meyer, I believe, was part of the Inspector General staff is familiar with your case. Dan, uh, do you want to uh, echo anything? Or is my microphone working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. This is my first Zoom call. I haven't done Zoom before. You oh. might hear the garbage disposal in the background. We just finished up dinner. So uh, I was the lead investigator on David's case. <clears throat> I tried to turn it down twice uh, because I'm, I'm, I was not a religious discrimination investigator or expert. I had no EEO experience at all. But Senator Levin was pretty adamant that there needed to be a review, uh, in part because there was uh, concerns that David was abused by the security officials doing their job in a way that was contrary to the regulations that govern the way polygraphs are administered. Um, in the process of doing it, David's right, uh, it was absolutely baffling the anti-Semitism that just came out of the walls in our office. And I think the best anecdote I can give is at one point I had two law clerks, a Roman Catholic and a Jewish uh, law clerk from GW, George Washington University. Um, they both went on to have great legal careers. It's been almost 10 years. And I put them together so they would fight over this because I knew Lindsay would be sympathetic to David because she was Jewish. And I knew Chris would have to fight his, his upbringing and some of the anti-Semitism I saw in the Catholic Church as a child as they worked through the evidence. And they did this marvelous presentation where they took all the anti-Semitic quotes uh, that were uh, levied about uh, David and all the testimony and they put it on a, on a bulletin board. And then I said, okay, take all those quotes, remove the word Jewish, and put the word African American or black in there instead, and put it on the other side of the bulletin board. So there were two sets of quotes, the original, which mentioned religion, and then the doctored ones that mentioned race. And it was sitting in a cubicle uh, that the special agents had to walk by, uh, Within four hours, we had five complaints from African-American uh, special agents who said there was racist postings in one of the cubicles, uh, but nobody found the same quotes with religious words in there to be a problem. And so I took the, I took the poster board up to the inspector general, who was an evangelical Christian and was actually very sympathetic with uh, Israeli causes. And I said, General Kicklighter, this is the experiment I just ran down on the ninth floor. This is why we're having a problem with our senior officials. They don't see the discrimination as discrimination. And he looked at me and he said, okay, the word discrimination goes in the report. But even with a three-star general's backing, Kicklighter was behind the finding 100%. Uh, all the senior officials wanted to round the finding, take out the evidence that would have been essential for David to get what a whistleblower needs in these cases, a remedy. And that's what happened. They issued out a watered down report and then the army said, well, there's no evidence in that report. So we don't have to follow through on this finding of discrimination. Uh, we can just put it on the shelf and, and effectively David's reward after what, 10 years uh, was a report that, that had no remedy attached to it. And, and that was intentional because they absolutely were annoyed that he challenged the security process. Uh, and as I just put in a, in a little tap on the uh, chat section, the evidence that tipped my hands were two pieces. One was the FBI gave up the investigation. Gugino knew he had no counterintelligence case, and yet the local security officer kept going. And then the other piece of evidence was in a deposition. I had a federal official tell me that David could not be loyal to the United States because of the Babylonian captivity that Jews were inherently disloyal because they had a, you know, the whole get, you've heard it before, the, the dual state loyalty issue. Uh, and when I took that transcript up to General Kipletter, he said, you got your finding. The guy was discriminated against. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Uh, David, another question. 
uh, for you. And g given what you've gone through and given how you were treated and how basically your career has been ruined, like you said, that, that uh, you, you, you can't leave uh, uh, to go to work for anybody else because your, 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 career, your career has, has been besmirched. Um, what, what would you like Americans and American Jews to do on your behalf because of, the, of this, this kind of discrimination? What can we do to help the situation in the, your case? I think it's, it's very simple. And this was actually told to me by a very knowledgeable person that people need to write their con congressman. Because again, I want to make this very clear. This isn't just, this isn't only a Tenenbaum issue. This isn't only a Jewish issue. This is an issue of a lack of accountability and a lack of people taking um, uh, responsibility for themselves, i.e. The, the army. They, people need to write to their senators and congressmen and say, we, want, we would like you to um, order the Office of Special Counsel, because I have a case now in the OSC, Office of Special Counsel. They've had it for probably a year, a year and a half, and they've done nothing with it. And the only way they're going to do anything with it is to be pushed by uh, higher level people, senators and congressmen, and they have, to, they have to be told, senators and congressmen have to tell them, tell the, the Henry Kerner, who's the head of the OSC, do a full investigation on this case. That's the only way things are going to happen. Yeah, it, it would be great. Uh, and, and again, the congressmen have to write Henry Kerner, who is, I can, we, can, we can give them information afterwards, who is the U.S. Uh, head of the, the OS, of, of Office of Special Counsel, and tell them this. We want a full investigation. It's got to come from senators, congressmen. And if, if people have connections within the mainstream media or even our administration, I always tell people too, um, um, I don't know if you saw that also, the Congress doesn't even need to take a position if the special counsel does a full investigation. All they have to do is say, do it. You don't have to say he's right or wrong, just do the investigation. If someone has, we know that President Trump does not like the way the political system works. He doesn't put up with the bureaucracy. Whether you believe in Trump or not has nothing to do with it. This isn't a political issue of Democrats and Republicans. It has to do with, with he is a, he's, he's pro-Israel, pro-Jewish. I think if he knew about this, he would step in right away and say, we're going to fix this right away. But again, I don't have connections in there. I don't have connections to the Hollywood celebrities who would chime in on this and would get involved with this, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish. So again, probably the most important, if people have connections, use them. If people, um, um, could, they can write letters to their congressmen, senators, tell them, hey, we want you to send a letter to the Office of Special Counsel and we want to get a full investigation going. Got one more question and then we're going to, uh, um, uh, actually two, two, two more two, two questions. Uh, one from one of our national board members. Uh, um, how, do, how did you afford your legal fees? Uh, uh, it, all these years? Initially, we, um, we, we borrowed money, we paid for it ourselves. And then um, I was told by one of a close rabbis of mine, because people wanted to get together and start helping funding to start a fund for it. And I'm pretty stubborn. I don't like taking things from people. He said, it's not up to you, because you're not just fighting for yourself anymore. You're fighting for all of us. If you lose, we lose. So we had money that help, was helped from the community or people had donated to the cause. And quite honestly, at this point in time, Mike Morganroth has taken this on as a cause and he's not ever, ever asked me for a dime. Mm -hmm. He just said, uh, it's an, amazing just doing this because he believes in it. And that's the kind of the people he and Dan Harold are like. Yeah, that question came from our national board member, uh, uh, Paul Tartal. Very good question. One last question, and then we're gonna turn it over to Kobe Eretz. Uh, our ZOA uh, Michigan Executive Director to, to wrap it up. One question, uh, wh uh, what was, uh, what did the ADL, did the ADL or did the ADL help or have they helped and, and what did other national Jewish organizations, did they step in and help you and if not? It's a pointed question. <laughs> I'll answer like this. Um, the ADL at one point, after years of get, trying to reach, of getting through to them, they put in an amicus brief, but nothing's happened since then. 
I approached the ACLU and actually my attorney approached the ACLU. They actually hung up on me um, years ago and they hung up, I think, on Dan Harold. We, um, um, we approached, we had letters from a number of groups, letter of organizations, and um, I guess they did whatever, whatever they could. Um, we would love organizations to get involved at this point, whether they're Jewish or not, evangelical, I don't care, NAACP, because the truth is, it affects everybody. It's not, it's not just a Jewish issue, and that's the mistake people make. So I, I, don't, I don't really know. I can't tell you other than that letters were written, um, but it, I guess they did whatever they felt they could do. A ch chilling situation you've gone through, and may you get the resolution and the justice you you, you so d deserve. We we, you. All, we all know that uh, the original Dreyfus situation happened uh, what uh, over a hundred years ago, and here we are in the United States, 2020, and it's still going on, unfortunately. Kobe, let me turn it over to you, Kobe Eretz, yeah, um, a Michigan Executive Director. Thank you, Shell. Thank you, David. That was, uh, that was a, very, a very interesting story and a very interesting reality and an unfortunate reality. Um, Zioe is here to help you. Um, and again, uh, we hope anybody from the, anywhere in the, new, in the U.S., if you want David to come and speak to your shul or to your uh, JCC, we would love uh, for this to happen. Please contact us, uh, zioe.org, uh, or somebody at your region. Now, why is it so important to to support ZOA? And this is why, and this is why it's so important for me to to say this right now. We are at, 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 in a war right now, um, and if you look at anti-Semitism and if you look at BDS, to remind you, BDS is not new. Uh, if you if you remember, if you remember seeing pictures from Nazi Germany where you saw Nazi Germans, SS uh, soldiers, standing in front of Jewish stores and saying, do not shop here because this is a Jewish store. This is what's happening today um, on campuses around, around uh, the US. People are saying, don't buy from Jews, only they don't call it Jews, they call it Israel. And ZOA is there to, to fight this. If you, if you, when I go and I debate J Street or New Israel Fund on campus, you, you will be shocked to see how many Jewish students are, have already uh, adapted the Palestinian narrative, or have already say, said Judea and Samaria does not belong to the Jews. Um, and, and this is what we're up against. ZOA, um, we, are, we need your help, we need your support. The other organizations, they are supported by billions of dollars. And ZOA is standing sometimes as a lone voice in the US. Um, and, and, it, and, and we're there for you. We're there for people like David, we're there for people who, who feel, who get harassed on campus because they're pro-Israel. And so we hope you support us in the future. You can go to ZOA.org to, to donate or to MIZOA.org to donate. Um, if you want to get David's book, tomor by tomorrow morning, we're gonna have the link to buy the book. Uh, it's a very good way to support David. To remind you, when, when anti-Semitism is there, there are people who are silent, and then there, there are people who, who voice their, their, uh, um, their, their voice against it. Now, you can decide where you wanna be. And ZOA always decides that even when it's not comfortable, we're out there, we say what needs to be said. Even if it goes against an administration, even if it goes against the US administration, this is where we are, this is where we're at, and this is why I'm so uh, proud to be part of ZOA. So again, mizoa.org, the link to the book will be there tomorrow morning. And tomorrow uh, at 7 p.m., we have an excellent program. Uh, it's gonna be moderated by our excellent Sharona Whistler from uh, ZOA Florida. And it's gonna be about the campus war against Israel. Uh, the author of the book is Dr. Richard uh, uh, Kravitz. And again, 7 p.m. tomorrow, we, we encourage you to, to register and to spread the word. Uh, David, any final words? Before yeah, we... just one, one last thing. Um, I actually should have said this in the beginning. I want to really thank the ZOA. Uh, they've really been behind me as well. And, and the New York Center for Civil Justice, Dr. Engelberg, Michael Engelberg, has really supported the book and supported me through years and years. 
Um, and I thank you, Kobe, for inviting me and Sheldon, and as well as Eugene Greenstein. You guys have been great, and I really appreciate and giving the opportunity. Okay, thank you, everybody. And again, uh, I hope you spread the word. Uh, this is not just a uh, David Tenenbaum case. This is a Jewish case. This could happen to any one of us um, at, at any situation, at any moment. So uh, let's stick together. Let's, let's fight for Israel. Let's fight for what's, for what's right. Um, and we'll see everybody tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, with uh, Sharona's event in Florida. Thank you, everybody.